All right. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce Carl, who will be talking about us about reverse engineering uh, SCADA networks. All right. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for coming to the, uh, the final talk of the uh, Build It track. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about uh, reverse engineering uh, wireless SCADA networks. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with what SCADA is, but just in case you aren't, it stands for Supervisory Control and Data Acquisition, which is basically just a bunch of fancy words for saying it's you know remote control and monitoring of industrial systems. And these are used in, in a lot of uh, critical infrastructure applications, such as uh, the power grid, uh, water supply, uh, oil and gas lines, things like that. And over the past few years, it seems like it's become the hot new thing. So, you know, at, at uh, DEF CON and RSA, you have the, um, the SCADA or ICS village. Um, at, uh, it's even finding its way into things like uh, the NCC, NCC DC competition, where they have like students try to hack this fake SCADA network. And there's, there's been so many talks submitted on SCADA stuff that uh, even like the, the DEF CON and, and Black Hat CFP um, board members are uh, getting pretty tired of it. Um, but this, these issues have actually been around for a while. So I, I was going back through, through the archives, found this uh, great talk from 2006, which is, um, covers all sorts of uh, fails uh, with connecting these SCADA systems to the internet. Um, their, their first example is basically they hopped on um, the uh, power, power generation uh, stations Wi-Fi in their conference room and got to like basically close to the generator. And um, then they were asked to stop. Um, back in 2007, uh, DHS um, did this fun uh, Project Aurora test where they have this um, uh, diesel generator, I believe, that's connected to this uh, SCADA system. And by, I believe what they are doing is connecting it and disconnecting it um, uh, at uh, various uh, phases. Uh, such that it gets out of sync with uh, the rest of the grid. And when you connect it, when it's out of phase, uh, things get very bad uh, very quickly. And then it just goes downhill from there. And there's another view of that. So uh, and that was just, you know, with, with some packets, connecting it, disconnecting it. Um, of course, now there's things like Shodan and Census, uh, where you can just search the internet for uh, these uh, SCADA-facing systems, either um, through the um, through specific SCADA protocols like DMP3 or Modbus, or um, sometimes you'll see uh, VNC interfaces to what they call the HMI or Human Machine Interface, and this is a hobby enjoyed by many. Uh, so. Um, this guy, Vis, loves to uh, scan the internet for open VNC sessions and check out what, what's going on out there. And, you know, you run across all sorts of crazy things on connected to the internet. Like, I think this is a Korean power system. Huh? Potato storage, Potato storage farms? Yes. I mean, there's, I think he gave a talk on, like, 105 crazy things that are connected to the internet or something. Nice skating rink, thing, things like that. Um, so there's been a lot of attention on uh, SCADA systems connected to the internet, but SCADA systems are not just on the internet. There are lots of legacy systems that use things like serial lines, uh, dial-up modems, uh, dedicated uh, leased lines from the phone company, and of course what we're talking about today are radios. Um, and so uh, around where I live, uh, we were seeing these uh, interesting antennas sitting next to these interesting looking uh, power boxes. Um, and we were interested in what they were and how they work and um, uh, what they were doing. As an aside, you'll find lots of interesting things on the RF spectrum. Uh, so you have like mobile data terminals for taxis, police, uh, you have a lot of other things that are, uh, a lot of other utilities, um, 
do all sorts of things. You have transportation systems, so like um, uh, train control, things like that. Um, so part of this talk is um, sort of a case study in, in how I approach trying to reverse engineer uh, these types of radio systems so that if you see something interesting on, on the spectrum that you want to, uh, to figure out and, and listen in on, uh, this might give you some, some starting points. But back to SCADA. Um, so I, I, we, we saw these boxes and we were curious what they actually were. And as it turns out, at least in California, it's required by law that the utility makes uh, certain documents available that uh, basically describe exactly what's in there. Um, and these, uh, these documents are for, uh, say, developers um, of uh, subdivisions, for example, and they'll tell them, hey, you need to acquire this equipment from us and install it this way and, and set it up uh, in a, a certain manner. Um, so what's actually inside here is um, a pad-mounted switch which uh, connects sort of the neighborhood to the rest of the, the uh, power distribution system. Um, and that's that box on the right there. Um, the control signals for that switch and the sensing signals for like power, current, things like that, go back to this other box. Um, and inside that box is what's known as a remote terminal unit, which uh, does the actual control of the switch. And um, that interfaces with a uh, radio, which uh, does the actual wireless link um, over, over the antenna. So we were, so we now know what's, what's inside the box, so we, we started scanning around the spectrum and um, we found some, some interesting signals and I don't think I have audio here, but um, if you hear that, that's the type of radio I'm talking about. Uh, conveniently enough, you can also look up these frequencies in one of my favorite websites, the FCC website. Uh, so you can put in either your service provider um, or you could search uh, for um, particular frequencies and see who owns that frequency and um, what they're using it for and things like that. So the first thing that we did is uh, we uh, used GNU Radio to start uh, listening to the signal and uh, plotting it out and trying to figure out what it actually is. So um, because we could hear that with just sort of a narrowband FM demodulator in um, uh, 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 the, the software-defined radio tool that, that we were using, that suggested that it was some sort of, um, we could use some sort of FM demodulator and get some sort of signal out of it. Uh, and so if you just set up a standard FM demodulator and GNU radio and then plot the output, you would see something like this. And this looks very interesting because um, you can sort of see bits there. It looks very digital. Um, but there are some issues here, like what's up with, with those points? Why, why are they sort of in the middle there? It's, it's not like a, a one or a zero. They're sort of just in between and, and doing some weird things. And so we weren't entirely sure how to um, uh, decode this actual signal, so we went back to those documents. And as it turns out, it says um, that the radio is a uh, MDS radio. So we did some searching on uh, what an MDS radio is. Turns out MDS um, is, uh, stands for Microwave Data Systems. They were acquired by General Electric uh, many years ago, and they make uh, radios for all sorts of types of uh, SCADA applications. And so we were hunting through the site and we found what we thought was the radio that was uh, used in this, uh, in this system. And so I went to my other favorite website, which is still the FCC's website, but a different portion of it. Um, and as it turns out, in the US, to, to sell anything that transmits a signal, you have to get an FCC ID and uh, get it uh, approved by the FCC. And for that, you have to submit a boatload of documentation to the FCC, including uh, schematics, theory of operation, uh, internal photos, things like that. 
Um, and some of it you can uh, request from the FCC's website. Um, now, unfortunately for us, uh, they can request confidentiality for certain, um, certain aspects, uh, such as, you know, uh, the schematics and things like that on, on trade secret grounds. So usually you'll see um, something in these systems basically saying that we would like uh, these documents to be uh, permanently confidential. Um, except sometimes they screw up and don't send that letter. And so uh, it turns out that we got the, uh, the theory of operation and, and block diagram for this particular modem. Um, but it was really weird. It's, it, it, so instead of, it, it said, um, let's see here, uh, it uses a continuous phase uh, frequency shift keen modulation that we knew, but it uses this crazy dual binary encoding that we knew nothing about. Um, there's very little information on the internet about how this actually, this dual binary thing, uh, what it is and how it works. Uh, and so this left us even more confused um, because we weren't quite sure what was going on there. Now, as it turns out, this, this dual binary uh, setup actually uh, explains uh, the little weirdness here that's going on. And so uh, we actually had to uh, account for that uh, to, to get bits out. And so to explain what, what dual binary encoding actually is, uh, let's take a, a few minutes to talk about uh, digital modulation. So when you're, when you're sending a signal, a digital signal, basically you're just sending a square wave of, of a, a bit stream. Um, and these square waves modulate a carrier in, in some, some way. So you could have amplitude modulation, frequency modulation, phase modulation. Um, you can uh, uh, do all sorts of fancy things with that that I won't go into much. The, the problem is if you just uh, modulate a carrier with a square wave, it'll take an infinite amount of bandwidth. And you can actually experiment with this on your own in GNU Radio. So um, on the top here, we have um, the, the uh, time domain of a signal that I was generated. Basically, it was sort of an on-off keying of a certain carrier. And uh, below that is actually the, the FFT, or the frequency domain, of the signal uh, that is coming out. And as you can see, it takes up a whole bunch of bandwidth when you're doing that. And as you mess around with the frequencies, you can see uh, different things happening in the frequency domain. But it's basically just all over the spectrum. Um, and so the, the reason for this is that uh, square waves are a sum of odd harmonics. And so um, it effectively uh, includes uh, an infinite number of frequencies. Um, so the way around this is to remove some of those frequencies. And you usually do that by, by filtering, uh, filtering those frequencies out. Um, this introduces what's known as intersymbol interference, uh, where the, the individual bits start smearing over time, and they start uh, colliding with each other. Um, and when that happens, it, you uh, can't tell what, what the uh, bits or the symbols are anymore. And to, to sort of explain why that happens, um, look at uh, what a filter's uh, impulse response is. So imagine if you had just a, a, uh, a signal that was completely constant except for a single blip at an instantaneous um, point in time. Um, if you actually look at what happens and you put that through a filter, you actually get a, a signal that um, is spread over time coming out of that filter. And this is known as the impulse response. I uh, won't go into much detail about it, but basically if you have just a, a single instantaneous blip, um, it can last for a long time. And so the actual way that you get around inter symbol interference in many systems is what's known as a raised cosine filter. And so this is the, the impulse response for a raised cosine filter. And the interesting thing here is that, um, so the, the symbol period is T on this graph. And so um, at, at time zero, the impulse response is, is one, so uh, you have all the energy there. Um, at multiples of the symbol period, 
the impulse response as zero, which means it contributes um, nothing to the, the instantaneous uh, time domain signal. And so if you overlay these on top of each other, you get a bunch of these like nice uh, shaped uh, sort of, of curves uh, where the, the uh, contribution from all of the other curves at precisely the, the right symbol time, um, you get no contribution from those, those other, uh, those other um, responses there. And so this is how things are normally done. This modem doesn't do that. Um, instead, what it does is it uses what's known as a controlled intersymbol interference fil filter. And the reason they do that is this basically doubles their, their bandwidth and gets closer to the, the theoretical uh, bandwidth limit of, of the channel. Um, and they use what is known as a cosine filter, which has um, uh, inner symbol interference at precisely one symbol interval. And so this is what that looks like. So you have the, the uh, impulse response for two different bits here. Um, uh, the blue one, which doesn't look very blue on the screen, and, and the, the pink one there. Um, and so at, say, time negative one, uh, the blue symbol's being set. At time zero, the pink one's being sent. And in between, uh, they add up together. And then um, at all the other times, uh, they add up to zero. They don't contribute anything. And so this means that the actual signal um, depends on the previous bit that you received. And so you can add these up in different ways. If you have one symbol that's sort of going down and one symbol going up, then the, uh, when you take a sample, uh, the actual uh, signal is at zero. And this partially explains why um, you were seeing those, those weird things in the, in the signal there. And uh, because this is a, a controlled um, uh, filter and doesn't last forever. If you have like multiple recurring symbols that are the same of these positive going bumps, then you just get a nice uh, steady, uh, steady signal there. Um, so the other half of this is that that filter that you apply to smooth out those bits that you are sending, um, it for, uh, for various reasons, it's optimal to do half of the filtering on the sender side and half of the filtering on the receiver side. And so we actually had to recreate the filter that they were using um, to um, uh, fully get, uh, get this controlled inner symbol interference. And so basically the way that you do that is you have, you know, this cosine uh, function and you just... Um, uh, take the square root of of that because um, let's see why do you take the square root of that I forgot whatever all right so <laughs> so you convert it so ba basically to to make a, a filter you you take the um, the impulse response you want in in the time domain you take an f uh, inverse FFT of that and then you got your your filter coefficients and so that sort of looks like this if you do it in in Python so you have your um, your uh, squared cosine function, and then you have uh, your um, impulse response there, uh, and then you're all good to go. And so if you apply this um, at, to a, a uh, if you apply this as your filter coefficients to uh, a fur filter in GNU radio, uh, it can improve the signal. So on the middle there was our original signal, and on the top there is, is our newly filtered signal. And you, you might notice that um, the sort of excursions around zero or around the center are far less pronounced. Um, and there's some other subtle, subtle improvements there. But now it's starting to, to um, make a lot more sense. And so now we get to sort of the easy part. Um, so if you, if you see a, a positive blip, the bit's a one. If it's a, a negative blip, uh, the bit is a zero. If it's at zero, then the bit is the opposite of what you last saw. And so you can actually um, start decoding this by hand and coming out with um, a bit stream, and then you can try to reverse engineer that. <laughs> 
Um, so it seems, you know, obvious where to sample, either at the peaks or, or at the, the zeros. Um, but I actually tried decoding this by hand and uh, got some weird gibberish out that didn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, and in fact, it looked pretty random. And so wasn't entirely sure why, why that was happening. Um, the, uh, the FCC documents actually explain some of that, but not a whole lot of that. Um, so for figuring that out, we went to the uh, MDS website. Turns out you can download the firmware for these modems. Um, and these modems, uh, if you look at the internal photos, they, ha they have two processors. There is an 8-bit microcontroller, and then there is a, uh, a DSP chip that does the uh, modulation and demodulation. Um, and, but there's only one firmware image, and so we had to figure out which bytes belong to uh, which processor, um, so we had to reverse um, sort of the 8-bit microcontroller that manages the radio to figure out how it loaded code into the DSP. Um, and so we, we isolated what the, um, uh, the, the DSP code was, and then we brought it into IDA, and holy shit, that looks like a mess. So, like, in this architecture, uh, you can have three operations per instruction. And so you see a lot of this here in like the middle where it's doing, you know, whatever MPYR is on, on one oper on some operands. And then in the, uh, simultaneously, it's doing a data transfer between various registers. And it, it's very messy looking. And we couldn't get our, our heads around it at all. Um, turns out it was an Indian issue, so we just swapped the byte orders, and then everything looked a lot cleaner. It was still um, kind of a nightmare to reverse engineer. Um, uh, so we didn't go a whole lot down that route, but um, I'll talk about uh, some things we found uh, in a minute. As it turns out, you can also, once you account for the uh, Indianness issue, if you just plot the firmware, as a bunch of 24-bit uh, floats, uh, you get something that looks like this, which is very interesting because you see those, those nice uh, pulses there that were like the, uh, the um, uh, filter response that we created earlier. So you could actually just avoid doing all this math and extracting, uh, extract it out from the firmware just by visualizing it. Now there's, there's some complexity in there. You need to know the sample rate and, and things like that. Uh, so it's not quite straightforward. Um, there's a, another part of, of the firmware memory. So it's, it's nice to visualize things. Um, but it, it, was, it was a pain to reverse engineer. So we, we decided that, um, so early on we, we were going to try to do this uh, completely uh, just by ob observation and, you know, not cheat and get our hands on an actual modem, but we broke down and, and realized that was probably the most sensible thing to do. So we went to another favorite website of mine, eBay. Turns out you can buy these radios for about 50 bucks off of eBay. Um, now you might say, that's not fair. There's no bids on that yet. Uh, you can do a buy it now for 115. They're pretty easy to acquire. And so we got one and we retuned it into the ISM band, so we weren't stomping on any, anyone's licensed frequency. And then we turned the power way down uh, so that we weren't stomping on any uh, ISM uh, systems. And, and then we started sending um, uh, bytes through the serial port here. Now, as it turns out, that is not a standard serial port, so you have to figure that out as well. Um, and then we started graphing the signal back in GNU radio. And you can ignore most of what's on here except for the, the purple line there. I'm not sure the colors come through that well on, on this, these projectors. But basically, we were sending various characters. And we would look at differences between the signals. So for example, this is an A, and this is a B. And you go back and forth, and you try to, try to see what's different and what's, what's the same. And so um, from this, we could, we could establish a few things. First, there was a, a standard preamble. Um, 
uh, of just like repeating ones and zeros or, or alternating ones and zeros, followed by some other random sequence um, that turns out identifies the type of the modem. Um, no subsequence of bits in the bits that we decoded actually translates as ASCII. And we were sending ASCII to this radio, so it's still a bit unclear what, what was going on there. Um, if you go back and, and look at this, there's no room, um, the, the packets are sh so short that there's no room for length field. So uh, we weren't entirely sure how they were communicating how long a packet was. Uh, there's also no room for, say, a CRC or anything like that. So it, it's starting to look um, uh, pretty simple. And uh, perhaps more interesting is the fact that if you send like multiple letters that are the same, like A and AA, AA is not just two A's um, back to back. It, it actually looks uh, completely different. Um, and so this probably indicates that there's some sort of bit scrambling going on. And this is not for security, but it's used for um, sort of whitening the spectrum and sort of spreading out, um, making it look uh, more random um, for various uh, uh, signal integrity reasons. Um, basically, you want to, to make your, your signals sort of uh, look uh, as uniform as possible in, in the frequency domain. And so to figure out how, um, how they were doing this bit scrambling, we went back to IDA. Um, we actually annotated these function names. They weren't given to us. Um, and the easiest way to find bit scrambling stuff in DSP code is just do a instruction search for XOR. It turns out that XOR is not a very common instruction in DSP code, and so when you see it, it's probably either a CRC or a bit scrambler or uh, something that does something interesting with the bit stream. And so we, we pretty quickly went through uh, this list. We found you know, a CRC function, and we also found the, the bit scrambler, which is a pretty simple uh, function. So it basically operates as a, a linear feedback shift register where you shift bits in and uh, s some of those bits in that shift register are tapped out and XOR together and then shifted back into this um, uh, uh, shift register. And so uh, we can easily account for this in our software and once we did that we started getting ASCII out and that was very exciting for us because now we can start uh, potentially listening on into uh, these SCADA networks. We found some other interesting things from disassembling this code. So it turns out they say that their baud rate's 9600. Well, it isn't. And that caused us some synchronization issues, um, which was driving me insane. Uh, it turns out they have like an off by one error in setting their uh, clock divisor. And so um, it actually transmits at not 9600, but 9618, uh, which is a little weird. Um, the individual characters that they send are not your standard 8-bit characters, but they're actually 9-bit characters, and they use the most significant bit to indicate um, whether it's sort of a, an in-band uh, uh, character that should go out the serial port, or it's um, for some sort of out-of-band management um, it turns out you can actually send uh, commands to these radios um, over the same channel as well. Um, and uh, we discovered that there's actually a couple of different types of preambles that uh, would identify the modem, either saying that it's uh, the sort of master station or the, the slave stations. Um, the master stations just pat out their packets with idle characters, and it's one of those special out-of-band <laughs> characters that indicates uh, that uh, there's nothing to be transmitted. Well, these slave stations will send a special out-of-band character saying, I'm turning off my radio, stop listening to me because all you're gonna hear is noise and uh, you'll get garbage trying to decode that. So we wrap this all up in a fun package called GRSCADA. And so uh, if you uh, uh, clone this from, from GitHub and compile it, uh, then you should be able to uh, uh, use um, uh, our, our work to also listen in on these, these modems and get uh, a character stream out. And so that was about 
the modem. Now I'm going to switch a bit and talk about how the modem is actually used um, in, in relation with, with uh, these SCADA systems. And so these, these modems themselves are connected to what are known as remote terminal units, which implement uh, what's also known as a multiple address service, which uh, basically means that they are all listening to a, a single master station, and the master station um, will pull these outstations or send them um, or send them commands uh, by the individual outstations ID, and these outstations will only transmit back when they are pulled by the master. And this maps well to uh, the old multi-drop serial buses that were used in uh, hardwired uh, SCADA systems. Um, using things like Modbus and the MP3. Speaking of which, there are two major protocols for, for SCADA, at least. Um, we, we mainly focused on DMP3 because that was uh, what was being used by uh, the local utility. Um, and what's interesting about these protocols is that um, they, were, they were designed for these, this older uh, wired serial bus system, so they don't really take uh, security into consideration. And so if you want to use these over wireless links, um, the wireless link itself has to implement security. Well, as it turns out, the wireless link says, security is not my problem. It's on the higher level stuff. And as you guess, no one implements security here. So it's, it's all out there in the clear, uh, unencrypted, unauthenticated. Um, and conveniently enough, these protocols are actually supported in Wireshark. And so uh, if you either have um, our GR SCADA module or if you go out on eBay and buy one of these modems, uh, you can just pipe it into like Netcat to uh, turn it into like UDP packets or TCP packets. And um, Wireshark will actually start decoding this for you. So uh, might be hard to read, but um, you can see the highlighted packet here is a response from station 5338 back to ID1, which is the master, saying I've got a response for a request that you had. Um, uh, some, some values changed, probably voltage or, or current or something like that. So now the interesting question is, well, how do you know what these sources, uh, source IDs map to? Well, turns out that utilities like to label things. And this actually maps up perfectly. So we, initially, we weren't sure whether the mapping was one-to-one was -one like that, but no, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's very convenient. Um, and so D, DMP actually defines uh, what are known as different types of objects. Um, and so you can have like a, an analog value object or a, a, a binary input or binary output, uh, things like that. And so uh, these objects are all addressed by some numerical ID, um, uh, which are known as points, um, but we weren't really sure what uh, these points map to and that sort of um, implementation specific. So we thought we were onto something um, based on uh, also more labeling by the utility, which said exactly what kind of pad-mounted switch they had installed. Um, if you go and, and Google the manufacturer, uh, followed by uh, the phrase DMP point, point list, you'll get all sorts of interesting documents online that will describe um, the, the mapping of these point IDs to various things, like uh, Point four is the current for phase A on switch one. Or uh, status point one says that the switch is open. Um, status point two says that the switch is closed. Uh, there are also control points. So control point two will let you open and close the switch by saying change control point two to either open or close. Um, you can do some other things, you know, start battery tests. Uh, other weird things like, found this interesting. There's a control point to enable or disable Wi-Fi. Um, there's also a control point to clear the Wi-Fi intrusion alarm. I have no idea what the Wi-Fi intrusion alarm is, um, but it's a single bit that gets set that says, yes, 
someone has tripped the Wi-Fi intrusion alarm, and then you can send another signal to clear it. Very weird. Um, so unfortunately, these are RTUs that were uh, sold by the, the switch manufacturer and integrated into those switches. Um, as it turns out, you don't have to use the manufacturer's RTUs. And in our case, um, uh, another RTU was, was being used. So the, the, none of the points lists that we found actually mapped to anything. So we decided to get creative and just start listening to everything and graphing it. And so we get these interesting look looking graphs here. Um, it, it crashed in the middle, so we don't have some data for, for a few months there. But basically, this is graphing. Um, the, the values are sort of bouncing around between like negative 6,600 and negative 7,800. And so I think that's about in the range of like a, a single phase voltage and a three phase. 13 kilovolt uh, distribution system. And so uh, we could sort of infer from this that uh, this, this corresponds to the actual uh, line voltage. Um, and you can see all, all these you know, cyclic patterns and dive deep in, into it and, and have a good old time. Um, but uh, there, the problem with this approach is that we were only, while we were listening to everything, um, all the, all the um, outstations have very directional antennas, and so we weren't getting most of the packets, and we were uh, also getting uh, some corrupt packets, so we weren't seeing everything. Um, and uh, so, one, we have incomplete data. Two, um, it's, it's a pain to go through and try to annotate this by hand. Uh, and so what we ended up doing is assuming that there was a handful of similar configurations um, and basically just using a simple clustering algorithm to sort of uh, try to identify the different types of, of outstations or RTUs um, that were out there on the network. Um, and so uh, it's still sort of an open question of whether we can actually map out these SCADA systems just by observing these packet traces or not. Um, but um, it's something that we've, uh, we've thought about at least. Um, so obviously, if you can listen, you can also send. Uh, and so uh, before I go into this, a big caveat here. Um, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure that messing around with power grid is dumb, dangerous, and very illegal. So all these attacks are theoretical. Uh, we didn't really have a way to test any of these. So uh, take, take these for, for a grain of salt because we just can't try to, to implement uh, these attacks. So a simple attack, the obvious one is, you know, command injection, send a, send a packet to one of these things to turn a switch on or turn a switch off. And because these are using um, sort of FM modulation um, uh, to, send, to send their signals, um, it, uh, it turns out that you only have to be a few decibels louder than the legitimate master to get your signal through. And this is due to what's known as the FM capture effect, where basically if you are, if you are slightly louder than someone else, the receiver will lock on to you and completely ignore um, the, the other sender. And so you just have to be a little bit louder. Um, a slightly more or slightly less dumb attack is to do command injection to the broadcast address. So it turns out DMP3 has a special ID of like 65535, which means uh, all RTUs. And so you could perhaps send a switch off command to this broadcast ID. I have no idea what'll, what'll happen. I don't suggest that anyone try this unless you have your own like RTU set up in the lab. Um, but I'd be interesting to know if that actually works or not. Uh, of course, the problem with this is you need to be line of sight with uh, all the stations that you want to affect. This is probably at the master station site. Um, uh, again, you only need to be a little bit louder. Um, and again, I've not verified this. Um, so there, there's still some, some open questions that I have that might be worth looking into. For example, how does the master station get its data? It's on top of a mountain. Well, that's probably another radio link. Uh, 
Um, and uh, it turns out utilities have all sorts of radio links. Some, uh, these are like 9,600 BPS. I've seen some on the FCC website that are 300 megabits per second. And so that's, that's crazy orders of magnitude larger. Um, not entirely sure what that is, probably like video surveillance or something, but I don't actually know. Um, <clears throat> another in interesting thing that we might look at is um, these out-of-band characters. So um, these radios, uh, you can manage them over a serial console, but you can also manage them over the air. So could we actually send commands to these radios over the air to retune them and listen in on a different frequency? And then it doesn't matter if the master station is trying to fix things, they're not listening to the master station. Um, and then another thing that we want to try doing is, is mapping out exactly where various things are by you know, basically doing war driving with some uh, pseudo Doppler radio direction finding thing. Um, and so uh, that's sort of on the back burner. We'll see, we'll see what, what happens. Um, so this is all about breaking uh, these, these SCADA systems. How about fixing it? Well, it, it turns out that utilities are indeed aware of these vulnerabilities. The problem is, is that there seems to be little incentive to, to fix uh, these issues in a reasonable time frame. Um, so these systems that are deployed have like a 30-year uh, lifetime. Um, and so if you, um, it's very expensive to go out and, and replace all of this infrastructure in the middle of its life. Um, it's, it's purely a cost for the utilities. Uh, it, you know, changing it will not generate them any more revenue. Um, uh, I believe they are required to do um, sort of a, a risk assessment and report that to regulators. Um, but I believe that most just say it's an, an acceptable risk. Um, and they're also sort of in a bind because um, Turns out that the vendors don't actually think that this is an issue. And so uh, it's very hard to find um, both or either secure radios or secure RTUs. Um, they're, they're just very hard to, to find. Um, and so even if utilities wanted to fix this and had incentives to fix this, I'm not sure they could fix this easily. Um, until they band together and start pressuring the vendors who make this equipment. So stepping back a bit and looking at the big picture, um, curious, you know, how exactly how pervasive these systems are. Uh, so they're all around uh, my neighborhood and other areas where I've lived. I don't see them at all. Um, I've uh, seen some around uh, Baltimore, I believe. Um, but not DC, so I'm, I'm not sure. Um, and you know, a lot of there was a lot of manual analysis that went into trying to figure out what these signals are. And it would be nice if there was a tool that we could just point at an unknown RF signal and say, "Hey, tell me what that is." Or try. It. So one way that might work is to try to uh, brute force combinations of like bit rates and modulation schemes and, th and scrambling patterns and things like that and try to uh, pull out some, some interesting information. Um, so it's, it's very easy to scan the internet now, um, but it's not very easy to scan the RF spectrum, especially over a wide geographic area. Um, so I think it would be interesting if uh, someone were to try to tackle that problem and um, basically do uh, the Z map of the RF spectrum. Not entirely sure how that would work, but it might be interesting. Um, uh, a final point is that uh, RF security through obscurity is basically over. Uh, with GNU radio, you can decode pagers, you can decode G GSM traffic. Uh, you can decode these uh, Project 25 radios, which are sort of the federal standard now for um, uh, uh, official use. Um, you can decode ADSB packets, which is like aircraft locations and things like that. Uh, recently, there's been work on decoding uh, NMARSAT and Iridium satellite messages. And, and so basically, any, anything out there that's not encrypted will probably get listened to. Uh, sooner rather than later uh, through the magic of, of software-defined radio. 
Um, so to, to uh, wrap up, um, basically, the, despite major attention on uh, uh, SCADA security over the years, uh, there's still critical infrastructure that is exposed over these non-IP channels. Um, when you're evaluating the security of a system, uh, you sort of have to look at it holistically. Don't rely on other layers to provide security for you. Uh, don't just focus on, on IP. And again, uh, RF security through obscurity, I believe, is, is over. So with that, I'd like to uh, thank you for your attention, and I believe we have a few minutes for questions. Any questions? So the question was, um, do we think it would be possible to patch the firmware on these radio units to bolster security? Um, I believe the answer is yes. However, um, you either need the cooperation of the vendor, um, and they don't seem interested, or you need to try to hack something together yourself, and if you're running you know, the power grid, you might not want to rely on some hacks that you did yourself. Um, so I think theoretically, yes. Practically, probably not without assistance from the vendors. There is some room in the firmware for adding, you know, AES or something. Or did I have to write what?